Hello and welcome to BPL's Contamination Control Refresher video. I hope you're sitting comfortably. My name is Dr. Tim Sandal and I am a pharmaceutical microbiologist and I am head of microbiology, quality risk management and sterility assurance at BPL. This year's refresher is focused on people and the way we interact with our environment and how we need to undertake good practices in order to reduce contamination control incidences. Okay, so we, we titled this year's contamination control refresher Back to Basics. And this follows a series of events that have taken place in pharmaceutical manufacturing at BPL where the sources of contamination have either been directly traceable to people or they've arisen as a consequence of our actions. So by back to basics, this is not intended to be patronising to those of you who've been here for a while but it's designed to reinforce good practices and to embed the quality culture and the culture of compliance that we're seeking to um, integrate and diffuse quality throughout everything that we do at BPL. Okay, so the first thing I want to get across is that you are the most important asset at BPL. You make a fantastic contribution to delivering safe medicines to the patients and we give you a number of tools to do that job. We have constructed well-designed effective clean rooms. We have sterilization technologies. We have proven detergents and disinfectants and we have clean room suits of the highest qualities but that final element that missing link that makes it perfect that, that allows us to make safe and effective products is you the people at BPL so just as a reminder about some basic concepts clean rooms are the the structure the bedrock within which pharmaceutical processing takes place they give us the clean space and by clean room we are assigning a fact that cleanliness is controlled and that's defined by the number of particles the concentration of particles in a given volume of air and that can be particles that could be um, fibrous could be particles that are carrying bacteria and fungi and we don't want those particles to end up in the wrong places. So we have this great support structure with effective clean rooms, HEPA filtered air, the right number of air changes so we're constantly putting clean air in and sucking bad air out and also through making the air move in the direction that we want it to move in. Now contamination can arise from a number of sources within the clean room and there's various industry studies that have attempted to break that down so if we go from bottom up we have the transport of items into and out of clean areas we have what might be residing on surfaces and here we need to be careful that we've put our gloved hand on one contaminated surface and moved somewhere else then we could be transferring contamination from one place to another and it's also important to, to consider that when we've disinfected a surface that you know there is a little bit of residual activity but effectively that surface can become recontaminated after it's been disinfected if some the wrong thing goes on to it then we have air and ventilation so as in terms of distributing contamination um, air represents a reasonable vector for that and then we have water and water is a double problem because there are certain types of bacteria the, the gram negatives the water loving organisms that thrive in water and can grow 
and also water is an effective vector of contamination so it can be through droplets and aerosols which is why we have to confine wash bays away from any critical processing and why we can never have water on a floor anything that leaks has to be dried and cleaned immediately and that leak addressed and that kind of overrides anything else but the biggest source of contamination is us is people and that's because we have a number of orifices which contamination comes out and our skin is a living organ where there are more bacteria than there are skin cells so the risks that we can present are from skin flakes so we are constantly setting shedding sorry thousands of skin cells every minute and these skin cells are carrying an average of around four microorganisms on them and also the oils that we secrete as well will also be um, reservoirs of contamination it's been shown that uh, cosmetics and perfumes are major sources of particulates and microorganisms which is why there's a zero tolerance approach to any cosmetics being worn into any of our clean rooms. We also produce uh, a, a lot of microorganisms within the, the mouth so coughing and spitting as well can send contamination huge distances clothing fibres, source of general particles and of also microorganisms, our hair, and the way we touch, and the way we move, and the faster we move, the more particles we will produce, and therefore the greater risk of contamination that we could present to the clean environment. It also stands that the different parts of the skin will carry different types of microorganisms and different numbers of microorganisms. So for microbiologists, there's fascinating research that's emerged over the past 10 years where microbiologists have attempted to construct an ecological map of the human body. And you know, if you think about the outside, if you think of how different a city environment is to the countryside, so are parts of the human body different in terms of their microbial communities and that's due to the different climates if you like. So for example we have more anaerobic bacteria in our hair follicles and around our forehead and these are kind of the bacteria that can cause acne in teenagers for, for example. We have very different communities in the moister area so under the arms between the toe webs, for example, around the groin, we're going to get different community clusters. On the drier, cooler parts of the body, such as the arms, we're going to get a different community as well. And these present different risks, and these risks are manifest in the way that we attempt to get changed and, and good gowning practices and so on. So controlling what's on the body is not as simple as it appears. And this is one of the reasons why the new changing room project is taking place and why we're going for the whole clean but not classified or controlled but not classified, the CNC concept, is because we're recognising what we might be transporting in. And clean room socks, for example, are one of the factors that we're introducing because of the um, contamination risk. Um, I don't know whether you know, but the uh, heel of the foot has the highest concentration of fungi that a human can carry into the general environment. Um, so, as we've said, we can spread microorganisms from um, sneezing, and there's a fascinating uh, stop motion photograph of a sneeze. And a sneeze can travel several metres, as we know from the uh, COVID-19 controls and also from coughing and from touching 
So we're not only like a uh, factory for producing contamination, we're also ourselves an effective vector for spreading that contamination around and around and around the environment. And the kind of human focus, the human factors, is picked up in the regulations. So we hear lots about GMP, and we hear lots about inspectors, and we hear lots about regulations. Um, so just to illustrate that, I've plucked uh, something from the European medicines inspectors, who rules still count despite Brexit and also from the US Food and Drug Administration, the US Inspectorate. So the first thing is the uh, European Inspectorate are recognising how important people are, but they also recognise that we need to be well trained. So the bit I've highlighted there much depends on the skill, training and attitudes of the personnel involved. The FDA, a little bit more specific, focusing on aseptically produced medicines, which is our business. And here they're saying that it's critical for operators involved in aseptic activities to follow aseptic technique at all times. So what does aseptic technique mean? Well, asepsis is trying to minimise contamination. It's trying to minimise the transfer of contamination from a source that um, probably has contamination, like us, and avoiding that going to something that we want to keep free of contamination or infection. So the origin of the word is from surgery, and the origin of the word really was pioneered by Lord Joseph Lister, the man who invented the disinfection of surgical instruments, and the man who founded um, what became BPL from the Lister Institute of Preventative Medicine on the Elstree site. So a slight U connection there, which is of interest. Okay, so we mentioned about the thousands of skin cells we're shedding um, every minute. But if we start multiplying that up, then we are on to a figure of around a thousand million skin cells per day, which is a huge number. So if we lived a life where we did not move, then eventually there would be quite a revolting pile of skin cells around us. And you can see that probably in your own homes, although not for me to question your cleaning, but dust. Virtually all dust is skin cells. So you can see how dust builds up in your home and how you might need to regularly dust if you want to. Um, but that is a source of uh, human skin cells. And it's been estimated. And how has it been estimated? Well, people have been made to stand in kind of what they call bi aerosol chambers, which are like mini clean room boxes, and various measurements are taken. And that's shown that around 10% of the skin cells that we're churning out are carrying microorganisms on them. And it's been shown that um, women uh, actually produce slightly more um, skin cells without bacteria on them, but men produce skin cells with more bacteria on them. So men are a slightly greater source of contamination than women. And we can see that from um, <coughs> our controlled experiment of going into sterile operations where we have a separate male and female changing room. And if you're ever interested in those results, we, we can show that the male changing room is generally far worse than the female changing room, although both happen to be within a state of control. The levels of microorganisms are higher within the male changing room, which may not come as a surprise to some of you. Okay, so what do we do about all this contamination that we're spreading? Well, we wrap ourselves up in a clean room clothing to minimise that. So clean room clothing is best thought of as a giant filter. So we want to be able to breathe, allow our skin to breathe, allow oxygen flow, but we want the clothing 
to retain the microbial contamination and the particles as well. So studies again have shown, and, and there's some interesting studies from, from Sweden on this subject, that clean room clothing can reduce uh, particles of 0.5 micron, which is not visible to the human eye, by 50%. Um, which is very, very good. And the higher levels of clean room clothing that we use in, uh, say, aseptic processing um, can lead to a ninefold reduction of what might be released into the environment. But that only works if the clothing is worn correctly, handled correctly, and changed um, regularly. Now, all clean room clothing will eventually lose its effectiveness, that filter effectiveness. And that's because um, as we perspire, then the clothing becomes gradually moister. And that will affect the integrity, as will um, abrasions, um, just carrying out normal activities. So that's why in the aseptic filling suite, the maximum wear time of a suit is four hours. And in C and D areas, that we don't wear a suit for more than 12 hours or across one operating shift. But we also need to behave properly as well. So you can wear the suit, but you can behave badly, and that can then limit the good work that the suit actually delivers. It's also important that we don't go into clean rooms if we are not well. So, we must never ever go and work in a clean room when we have a respiratory infection. And that is because the ability of the mask is severely compromised by coughing and sneezing. We create more moisture and we're bombarding more microorganisms at that mask and that filter and that's limiting things as well. We also do not want to go into a clean room with an upset stomach for reasons that I won't go into, but you can imagine what they are. And there are other reasons where it might be inappropriate to go into the clean room. So, obviously not possible under the time of coronavirus, but if I was to go off to a hot country for a holiday and I wasn't very good at controlling the amount of time I sat in the sun or putting on appropriate suntan lotion I came back to work with um, sunburn and my skin was flaky I should not be going into the clean room. If I'm on a course of antibiotics then I may or I may not be able to go into the clean room that would depend on the type of antibiotic because that will affect one the degree of um, skin shedding but also it will change the level of potentially pathogenic organisms that I might be um, depositing. And if I've had a recent piercing, then I need to allow appropriate time for that piercing to heal, particularly around ears and nose and so on, as well as once they've healed, taking those piercings out. And also if I've had a tattoo, then also I need to allow that to appropriately heal as well. So with all those factors, there's no hard and fast rules, there's no magic time for someone to say, right, it's been three days, you can go in now. It depends on individual cases. So all we can do as employees is report these to our line managers and ask for an appropriate assessment to be made. And this forms part of the going into clean room SOP in use at BPL. Um, so why tattoos? And this is something that um, I'd like to highlight because it's um, slightly newer in our kind of control mechanisms. Well, it's been established that um, dermatitis is an effect of tattoos, bleeding and abrasions in an effect of tattoos, and some tattoos can take um, two to three weeks to heal. And during that time, there's a high skin shedding problem. And also some tattoos can lead to itching or to swelling. And some tattoos, tattoos with red pigments in particular, can react with sunlight and that can also cause redding and itching and that can carry on well after the um, general tattoo has healed. 
So we need to take particular concern with tattoos, even if you go for a microbiology themed tattoo, I'm afraid it doesn't make any difference. We still need to be mindful and have that discussion with our line managers. And there are other factors as well, as I mentioned about the, the piercings. Um, and we also don't allow nail extensions to be worn into clean rooms. Um, one, because they harbour contamination around the extension, and also because they tend to be fairly pointed and that can tear gloves. Similar with hair extensions as well. Um, some are of questionable um, cleanliness and others are um, also um, with the clips and things they can cause contamination risks as well and also if we go undertake tanning that's exactly the same so either that's um, tanning under a sun lounger the same sunburn effect or tanning lotions are equally should be classed as cosmetics and do present contamination risks as well so these are all big no-nos for going into our clean rooms and there is scientific reasons for for this and it's all about strengthening contamination control. We also need to be mindful of smoking and vaping and it's been shown that after smoking and vaping then the number of microorganisms coughed out of the lungs and through the nose increases substantially. Which is why again BPL procedures are saying that if you do have a nicotine addiction and need to engage in smoking or vaping then um, there should be an appropriate period before being at the place of work within the clean room. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't go through your normal procedures but you should at least have a few minutes break between that uh, before you end up in your place of work with your final mask on. And again that's embedded in the BPL um, SOPs. Okay, so we'll have a look now at contamination by transfer. And contamination by transfer is that risk I was speaking about, about how easy it is for us to transfer from one place to another. I also want to highlight again about this thing about walking and movement. So this was this work I was talking about earlier from Sweden. And here you can see the difference in particle generation. So we have a picture of somebody sitting down and you can see there that if they were not wearing clean room clothing they would be producing around 100,000 particles per minute. A light walk were up to 1 million particles. A brisk walk, a jog or even running, although we'd never ever engage in those kind of activities in a clean room, would be 10 million particles per minute. Now obviously we reduce all of that wearing the clean room suits by ninefold as I said earlier. However, by still walking too fast we can still produce too many particles. Which is why we walk slowly and carefully in C and D clean rooms and in the aseptic fillings we walk very slowly indeed and only move when we have to. So in a filling room the operators are generally motionless, standing um, often like that, um, so they are not a direct source of contamination. Um, and just to illustrate um, some of the other points I've said, which is why masks matter, and I actually added a reference to the um, Swedish research there, if you are inclined to go and read that up, you can do so at your leisure. But you can see there about the number of particles that are just pumped out by sneezing, coughing and speaking loudly as well. So there's various factors to take into account. Okay, and then we have makeup. Again, different piece of research, 20 years old, but still very valid. And here we can see if you know if we don't remove the cosmetics. And it's not a case of coming to work and removing the cosmetics. Really, the best thing is don't put the cosmetics on in the first place. Save that for your rest days. But you can see there how many, how many particles are released from lipstick, from rouging, from various powders. I'm pretending I know what I'm talking about. Eyeshadows and mascara. And you can see this eyeshadow and mascara that produce the highest levels indeed. So this is the reason why... Unfortunately, you can't wear cosmetics, but 
but we're all wearing the suits, we're all wearing the masks, and often the goggles, we all look roughly the same. So, we don't need anything else. Okay, so I'd like to talk about something which, personally, I find really fascinating. You may well not, but I'm going to pick out the bits that might be of more interest. Okay, so there's something called the Human Microbiome Project that was uh, made possible by advances in genetics. So um, a massive worldwide study was undertaken and there were um, 300 individuals, roughly 50-50 male female, and they um, agreed to have their bodies sampled everywhere. There were about 18 sites in total. And the analysis was looking at um, what's called culture independent methods, which is genetic kind of testing, and looking at, look at individual organisms and then look at the communities of those organisms, how they interacted. And there was like wonderful science that allowed that to be undertaken. And this kind of research, you know, showed the, these different types of bacteria that can produce from different body sites and this kind of reinforces some of the things I was saying earlier. So the forehead has the kind of acne producing bacteria. In most adults that isn't manifest but it, obviously in teenagers due to um, hormonal disbalance as well then it creates those opportunities for. And then other parts of the body we're getting different risks. So I'm not going to go through all of that. If you want to read that then there's a reference uh, by a paper by Elizabeth Grice which is um, pretty interesting but just the reason to emphasize that is to why we go to so much trouble for clean room gowning and uh, making sure we are wearing all the right things and as we move from D to C to B then we are eliminating exposure of any skin whatsoever. Um, and then just to touch again on the um, shedding aspect, and, and, and this again is one of these fascinating stop motion photographs where you can see the, the tiny skin particles that have been magnified in this context to, to give a relation with the hand, they're not quite that big, but, but it's given that as an illustrative purpose. Um, <clears throat> so it actually stands that after four days, we have completely replaced the entire outer layer of the human skin. So you think of the way that a snake sheds its skin in one go with um, people, that's being done um, a little bit more gradually, but it's, it's very similar um, principles. And again, there's reference there to, to the research because I always like to um, give you the opportunity to have a look at any research if you want to just to say that you know I'm, I'm not here I'm not lecturing to you making this stuff up what I am doing as a microbiologist is looking at the the science and giving you explanations to why certain things are important so work there by Bill White from the University of Glasgow tells us that 10% um, of all the skin particles that come off are carrying microorganisms so, back to gowning again. So, we should see the gown as this wrapping process to minimise the shedding of microorganisms. And also, we need to move into the barrier concept. So, wherever we have exposed product, we should attempt to minimise the risk. Now, early end processing, we don't have a lot of choice in the way we do that. Um, and we do accept a certain level of contamination, but we have microbial reduction steps in the process. The time we get into like VSA, everything becomes closed, everything in the AFS is closed, apart from the actual dispensing of the medicine. And occasionally there, although we have barriers and we have unidirectional airflow, we occasionally need to break that through the activity that's classed as an intervention. And we need to always treat the intervention as the most important, the most serious and the biggest potential risk activity that we could possibly do. 
So that's why there's an enormous amount of training, there's an enormous amount of specialist activity, and some of uh, the most uh, aseptic focused staff are involved in that activity, and it's regularly practiced through robust media fields. It also stands that we help minimize contamination getting into the facility by engaging and practicing personal hygiene. So we are responsible for our personal hygiene and we have a commitment to products and patients to ensure that we practice good hygiene. So by working at BPL and going into clean rooms, now again not wishing to sound patronising, um, but th these are just basic things that we have to do and there's a reason why we ask you to do those, which is to shower every day or bath every day, to change your underwear every day and to wash your hands regularly and always, always, always wash your hands in the first stage changing room as you go into building 27. That is of fundamental importance and that's even before you start applying hand sanitizer. And that's just because our hands are the primary contamination source because we are just touching everything. Okay. That is of great importance and we can't stress that um, more greatly. Okay, so we also need to um, factor in the quality of the gowns, whether we wear two gowns, who we buy our gowns from, how those gowns are laundered. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes looking at the uh, quality of the gowns that, that you're given. So the people that we buy gowns from, they have to take a sample of those gowns and they put them into a special washing machine and they carry out a particulate drum test. They send those gowns away for um, sterilisation. And with that sterilisation um, process, that's a proven cycle to reduce known levels of microorganisms. We have policies on how many times a suit can be re-laundered, which is set at about 50 times. But if there's any damage noticed on that suit, then that suit needs to be thrown away. Because anything that could risk the integrity of that gown means that you've got a structural weakness. With, with the shirt that I'm, I'm wearing, if I get a, a slight tear, um, thread here, eventually that's going to unthread and break. Okay, I can wear that for quite a few washes. It doesn't really matter, but it does matter in the clean room because that is a point of weakness and that could lead to a contamination event that we don't want to be faced with. Um, now I mentioned also about garments being filters. Well, hey, here is a 120 times magnification of clean room garment. And you can see there that it's this, it looks like a patchwork quilt, but it's actually over layers, okay, of the appropriate non-fibrous, non-particle releasing uh, polyester type materials. And it's acting there as this filter to keep contamination in. And that's quite a good photo, you know, if you can't start thinking, my gown is a filter, well, here's an illustration that kind of helps to kind of guide that in, in the right direction. Now, some people have said, um, why don't we use disposable gowns? Why do we use re-laundered gowns? And that's just come out from experience. And here we have shown that um, generally the lunar gowns are more comfortable and operator comfort is really important as well because if you're uncomfortable wearing the gown then you're going to get hot and flustered and you're not get, you know the, the movements and activities you engage in may not be as good so that's the reason why we do that and um, there's always going to be a balance between gown comfort and the filtration effect you know you could get gowns that are going to keep more contamination in but you'd not be able to um, perspire 
properly and feel increasingly uncomfortable. But anyway, the general thing is is that <coughs> relaundered gowns are more comfortable. Tyvek suits can be worn in emergencies for uh, a, a contractor to come in and do something, but they're not, they're not great long term in our experience. Okay, and then we have different types of gowns for different areas, and that's based upon the classification of the area and the degree of contamination control that we're wanting to achieve. And as I mentioned, that going into the aseptic area, and here is a photograph taken from BPL's aseptic filling suite, if you don't work in the area and haven't had the uh, good opportunity, the good fortune to go into the area, because it is a really important area. And you can see there it's fully enclosed and the objective there is to have no exposed skin whatsoever. And you, you know those who have been at BPL for a long time would know that it used to be um, safety glasses that transferred to goggles to give that complete degree of protection. Um, and those goggles are sterilised. And to be honest, it, it took a, you know, at BPL's kind of commitment to its staff, it took a long time to get the right goggles that one were comfortable and two didn't steam up. So, you know, it's working on that, getting that balance right between controlling contamination and looking after the staff and making sure people are as effectively as comfortable as possible whilst protecting products and patients. And it's all about trying to connect with the one best way philosophy and the culture of compliance that are uh, two of our kind of really big themes for this year. Okay so again with gowns we also need to make sure that they're not um, shedding particles um, because we equally have, although we also have concerns around microbial control, for those of you working in ILP or any part of that process will know that we also have um, very strict rules around um, visible particles and even those of you who are involved in quality control activities will also know that there's particular focus on sub-visible particles as well. So one, the quality has got to be good but equally if our gowns become wet they will become less effective. So work in an area we get splashed with water, oh, I've got to change my gown. If the gown becomes torn, I must immediately go out and change my gown. These are really important because anything that's going to break that gown efficiency is a problem, is a contamination source. So we just have to think, you know, am I still gowned correctly? Am I still filtering out what's on my body? If I've got a gown, I'll go and change my gown. Never be worried about the cost of the gowns. It's more important that you're keeping the product and process safe. Um, as I said, you know, we do have controls about how often the gowns are laundered. We're not going to keep on laundering gowns indefinitely. And we control that through um, the, uh, having a barcoding on the gown. Um, and we have strict controls over their use and sterilisation. Um, we also focus on um, whether we allow gowns to be repaired or not, and in the aseptic filling suite, that's a, a bit a big no. Some companies do allow repairs to be made on their gowns, and here they might look at the size of the hole, the number of repairs, the location of the tears, and the grade of the suit. But um, in general, we adopt a zero tolerance approach to um, our gowns. We put everything into their quality. And we have the controls over the wearing of the times as well, which again is important. And we also spend time working with our garment suppliers about how the gowns are packaged and how they're wrapped. And they're wrapped in such a way that when you undo it, it doesn't go flying out or it doesn't make it roll down onto the floor. So we have some control over that. Because when we put the gown on, we want to make sure that the legs of the gown are not striking the floor. Because in clean rooms, and remember I said about how well clean rooms work earlier, um, 
in terms of filtered air, air movement, air exchanges, but it remains that particles will eventually try and head for a surface. And the larger size of particles um, will be subject to some degree of gravitational settling. And it's established in physics that um, the larger a particle is and the closer that particle becomes to a surface, the slower its velocity becomes. So you have more chance of deposition onto the surface. So clean room floors generally will have the higher levels of contamination, which is why there's um, a lot put into the way gowns are packaged and there's a lot put into practicing gowning. A new starter coming to BPL um, will probably practice or should be practicing gowning dozens and dozens of times before they go into a clean room for the first time, which is why the whole um, training center has been constructed to allow that practicing to take place. So what are some good practices for going into clean rooms? Well, as I said before, ideally, don't come to work with makeup on. If you do come to work with um, makeup on, then remove it and um, make sure there's no traces at all. And then make sure that the um, you're doing the hand washing and all the other aspects. And then our changing areas are also well designed. So we do have slightly higher air change rates in the clean room. So we're pumping in more clean air because we're recognizing there's going to be much more particle shedding and particle deposition. We have controls over the numbers of people who are allowed in any changing room at any one time. Too many people in a changing room um, will create higher levels of contamination. It's going to land on someone, particularly if it's people coming in to get changed, someone's just been changed, those particles could well gravitate over those people. And in the AFS, to enhance this even further, we have a separate way into the filling suite and a separate way out to the filling suite as well, so that we're not getting clean operators zigzagging past um, operators who are yet to be fully gowned up. And it's also important that um, when we're going into the changing rooms that we're walking across a sticky mat or Dyson flooring, which is also a film of a sticky mat, it just doesn't feel as sticky, but it's um, polymeric flooring that is designed to electrostatically attract particles from your feet. And that we're um, going through changing in the correct order and um, we're having lots of controls. We don't have things like hoods poking out of our suits. Um, we're doing good practices like always wiping down the step over bench before we cross over it. We always have to have mirrors in clean rooms so we can see what we look like to make sure we're gowned up before we go into the main process areas. We have things like beard covers which can add extra protection because there's the risk of the bristles coming through and directly then you know we've got more risks of, of good particle control. And also then disinfecting our gloves once we put them on before we go into the main process area. And here we have um, special um, glove sprays for that purpose. So just on the subjects of glove sprays, people sometimes ask why do we have a different one for our bare hands compared to our gloved hands. Well the one for the gloved hands is slightly more effective, that is 70% isopropyl alcohol or IPA. However, if you apply that to bare hands, that will lead to dermatitis. So there's a fairly good one that's applied to bare hands, which is denatured ethanol, um, which contains emollients, which will prevent the hands from drying out. So that's why there's that distinction. Um, gowning training, as I said, is really important. Um, so we do lots of practicing before we go into the clean room. We have a training facility that allows us to do that good gown practices and then there are videos that can be watched to learn good gown training from. Going into the aseptic filling area then um, there is also environmental monitoring undertaken to show that um, the operator can gown correctly without creating great rafts of contamination that can then go back and contaminate the operator. And for all clean rooms there's an observational checklist undertaken once a year just to verify that our gowning practices are still robust. 
So, you know, if we got into bad habits where the leg was touching the floor, that would fail the observational checklist and we'd have to then go and do some extra training, come back in and have another go. Okay, face masks, that's a topical issue in the coronavirus um, era. But masks, again, are filters. And actually, in Europe, if you look at the European standard for face masks, they're actually called filtering face pieces, or FFPs. And these are made of materials that will not deposit fibres into the environment. They allow adequate filtration, because we want to be able to breathe comfortably. Um, they need to fit suitably tight, so we never get um, fogging of our safety glasses or goggles. They need to be able to withstand sterilisation, and they're designed to capture a high level of um, bacteria as well. So the face masks that we use to go into manufacturing areas are 97.5% bacterial filter efficiency which means that they will capture most of the bacteria released. And mask manufacturers have to undertake two tests. One is to show that the, um, they can capture small size particles. And 0.3, si 0.3 micron particles are used for that purpose. And also they undertake a bioaerosol test using a bacterium called Staphylococcus aureus and they generate bioaerosols and show that things can be adequately captured. And as important of masks are gloves. So they're designed to protect people from chemicals and they're also designed to stop um, skin bacteria getting into places and they also need to be compatible with the disinfectants that we're using. So there are lots of studies that take place um, looking at how well um, the gloves relate to disinfectants and so on. So there's studies that are undertaken um, in the microbiology uh, validation department, which is led by Kerry Skinner. And there are various kind of soup dunking experiments, and by soups, these are soups of bacteria, which are there to verify how well those disinfectants can actually get rid of any contamination being carried on the gloves. Um, another thing uh, with all this kind of clothing aspect is that it's also very important to wear clean room suits, gloves, masks of the correct size, which is why there are different sizes available. If you wear a clean room suit that is too big, then it will create air pockets and there is a risk of pushing particles out. If you wear a clean room suit that's too tight, you can't, well, can't really move and it's incredibly uncomfortable. So wearing the correct size is really important, particularly if you're carrying out a key activity because you won't carry that activity properly if you're not comfortable in the suit that you are wearing. All the gloves are too floppy or don't fit properly or the mask isn't suitably secure or the band of the goggles isn't tight enough for example. So we have these risks and uh, can this time um, relate to um, some of my own, own research this time. Um, so we do need to see ourselves as um, contamination risks and, and, and the point I'm making here is that no matter how well we do all of this we ourselves can still we're still going to be releasing a little bit of contamination so we still need to be mindful of all the other control measures. No matter how well we are going top to toe, we're going to keep in 97, 98% of the contamination, but we're not really going to be able to keep in everything in its entirety. So we do need to be mindful of that. We need to still practice the good movements, the regular disinfection, respect the barriers and all those kind of factors. We're not invulnerable when we go into the clean room, clean space. And we touched upon um, personnel monitoring as well and the importance around that. And the importance of gown qualifications as well. So I wanted to say a little bit more about what it's like to go into the aseptic filling suite for those who are not familiar. 
So here the gown um, assessment is every six months rather than once a year. Here there are settle plates exposed to see what might be deposited. There's active air samplers run and there are finger plates taken. And to go into the filling suite for the first time each individual is required to go into a room by themselves and active air sample is operated and they're required to slowly walk around that air sampler and there's a measure of the likely deposition of particles. Every time anyone leaves the aseptic filling suite they have contact plates taken on their gowns which is an assessment of the gown cleanliness which is shown what might be a contamination risk um, or what may have been a contamination risk and also how well the people are behaving, wearing and respecting the gown as well. So there are samples taken for example of the top of the head from a forearm and from the body torso and we seek where possible for those to be taken independently. So these are taken on exit and the locations selected are those that might signal a risk in the way that the operator has um, interacted with the product or the environment. And once they've been taken, then those plates are incubated in uh, Vicky Pettifer's microbiology laboratory and assessed for contamination. Where there is contamination, those results are sent to Claire Levy's Sterility Assurance for detailed investigation. And when the gowns have those agar plates taken on it then obviously it becomes itself a contaminated item and uh, needs to be disposed of for re-laundering um, carefully. So there's different locations that are taken as I mentioned and those locations vary between the gowning test where more locations are taken and routine monitoring. But you can see there why do we take the top of the head? top of the head is the warmest part of the body. If we're going to get excessive perspiration that is where contamination can come out. Arms because we're directly interacting, the torso because it's that main bit of the body again and the legs because occasionally um, people need to bend down to carry out certain activities. So not all of those locations are taken all of the time but they're all taken once a year and some locations are taken on every exit from the filling suite. So results vary, top of the head as I said is um, the one that's going to come up the most often with contamination. They can inform about certain activities undertaken, they can inform about contamination risks and they can help us link contamination events together. Often the um, microbiological data assessments are very much um, detective work. It's all based on information and linking that information together to try and work out what may or may not have happened. Finger plates again are a sample predominantly taken in the aseptic fiddling suite and these directly inform about what might have been touched by the operator with their hands. And these are taken using special agar plates that contain a neutralizer and this neutralizer can uh, will overcome the effects if there's any um, glove disinfection, any of the IPA remaining. And there's a particular technique that's used to allow those plates to be taken. Um, and they are of great value in assessing contamination risks for aseptically filled products. So they're always taken after critical activities and they're always taken at random intervals. Um, and when they've been taken, because there's a risk of little deposits of agar being on there, there needs to be a thorough hand disinfection activity undertaken. And the hand disinfection activity is one minute, applying a suitable volume and then ensuring that every aspect of the hands is um, subject to the disinfectant for a suitably long contact time. So there's always activities like the tips of the fingers, doing the palms and so on and so forth. And we can look at glove disinfection another time. For filling machines there are um, gauntlets as well. So these are changed for every filling run and these are 
sterilised. Um, they're made from rubber from Malaysia and they undergo irradiation. So they're subject to very, very powerful um, sterilisation technology. And um, it's very important that we know whether or not these were contaminated. So there's um, the sampling activity that's undertaken at the end of every filling run. Um, there's some other things that I um, just want to emphasize. So I mentioned earlier about, you know, if you see water on the floor, then, you know, you've got to address that water straight away. Um, if you're in an area where you're dealing with open product, and you're in an area that's anywhere in the aseptic filling suite, if something falls on the floor, it has to stay on the floor until the end of the activity when the product has left the room. And you just have to then have a spare item to use. And if that causes a delay, then it causes a delay. But you do not, under any circumstances, ever pick up anything from the floor whilst you're engaged in a product interfacing or aseptic activity. And I'm stressing that because it has led to um, some of our more serious contamination events that we've seen at BPL. Um, it's also important to um, get to grips with the concepts of airflow. So when you're working in unidirectional airflow devices, one, you have the minimum number of items within that unidirectional airflow device. Two, you never put anything near the back. You never ever block the air path. So you have to look at the different differences between vertical and horizontal um, airflows. And you need to never really um, have any exposed product or vials where you might be breaking the principle of first air. So first air, the air is clean. Whatever the air touches first is called the first air principle. And we want to make sure the clean air is still touching the objects that we're trying to protect first. So for example, if I had a um, open vial, I'm going to have to use a whiskey glass for that purpose. Um, the air is coming down, it's going over the vial. We've got good first air principles there. However, if I put my hand across it, I'm going to break that first air principle. There's a risk then of anything from my hand getting onto it. So before I go in and to do anything, I would have to have cleared that vial out of the way. And therefore, I am disrupting the first air, but there is nothing in the vicinity that's going to be contaminated. It's also important to clean and disinfect um, effectively, because that's our ultimate measure for if we're having all these various other control breakdowns, we're not paving the clean room properly, our gowns aren't working, um, we're doing other factors, then good cleaning and disinfection is of great importance. We always clean first we need to remove anything that's going to stop the disinfectant from working, any soil or grease and so on. Then we apply a disinfectant. Application technique is really important. So we use triple bucket systems, we mop floors with parallel overlapping strokes. We use wipes, we only use one surface of the wipe once and we can get about four uses out of the wipe by using the fourfold wipe technique. And we need to observe contact time. So all those other essential elements are important to for our people factors that we've been talking about. Okay, so in this hour that I've spent with you for the contamination control refresher, I've mainly focused on people for this year's theme because at the end of the day, most of the contamination's gonna come from us. So we need to control ourselves. We need to practice the best behaviors. We need to make sure we've got the quite correct tools, you know. So there are various things like make sure we've got gowns of the right sizes. Um, we need to report those in to our managers and make sure we're getting the, the right things to wear and the right things to do. And take personal responsibility as well in terms of how our personal hygiene and whether we've had things done that like tattoos that we feel oh, could be a risk, we'd better report that in. And we need to strengthen what we do by um, periodically qualifying ourselves, whether that's a visual observation going into a grade C or D area to a more detailed assessment going into the aseptic filling suite. And we're going to need to still regularly undertake audits to check that we're doing things properly. So this brings this year to an end. Just a 
state again that my name is Dr. Tim Sandal. I'm head of microbiology, risk management and sterility assurance at BPM. You can contact me at any time by emailing me with any questions, concerns or comments or anything that you see that might be presenting a risk to products or ultimately patients or you just want to know a little bit more detail why we do what we do. I'm always happy to help as is my entire department because microbiology is a customer focused department. You are the customer. We're here to help. We're all in this together. BPL strong and we want to create this culture of compliance through the one best way. So thank you for your attention. That's this year's Contamination Control Refresher over. Good luck with the rest of your day.